Memory verses, James chapter 1 and verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Kings chapter 19. I may have to adjust this a little bit, don't I? As I go through. The journey is too great for thee. It's time. The journey is too great for thee. I'm going to read out of uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, verses 1 through 18. Verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. But when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself <clears throat> that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drank and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken the covenant, thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they have seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and a strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the inner end of the cave and behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou hear, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because of the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The Lord said unto him, Go return unto thy way into the wilderness, of Damascus, and when thou comest to Haziel, uh, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Saphat of Abo Mehola, hast shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escaped the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay, and him that escaped the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which have not kissed him. Let us pray. 
Father, we bow our heads in reverence to your wonderful and precious holy name. Thank you, God, Father, for the things that you've done, the prayers that you've answered, and the needs that you have supplied. And I pray, Lord, you'll guide and direct our hearts, Father, and give us strength, Lord, to do your will. I pray, Father, you also give attentive ears to each one that's here. Oh, Lord, that you might be able to hear and understand. Father, receive your word as you would have it go forward and touch our hearts. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'll bless and be with each home, each family that's found its way. Lord, to be in your house today, may they be blessed because of it, but blessed especially by, by your Spirit, Father, and your hand upon them in teaching and guiding. Oh, Lord, we look to you today as the author and finish of our faith in our great God, for your will be done, Lord, in our lives. Father, give us an altar service. Be it according to your precious will. We're going to love you and thank you for it. In Christ's precious name, amen. Uh, if you look back into chapter 18, I'm not going to go there, but if you were to look back in there, you would find out that Elijah had just come through a marvelous and amazing show of God's power and His ability. And that uh, I would come to the conclusion, according to what Elijah had just experienced, that there was not anything too hard for God. Amen. It's that simple. That there's not anything that God can't handle or that God can't do. And He works through us. He works through human beings to get His will done. And He speaks to our heart, to our lives, that He might direct us, might direct our spirits, and might direct us by His Word that we might be found pleasing to Him in the things that we say, in the things that we do, the places that we go, the entertainments that we enjoy, uh, those things that we allow in our life, whether it be music or movies or what it might be, uh, God lead God and directs by all of these things to touch us and direct us into the Spirit. But let's look uh, at chapter 18 and the things that He did. He seemed that uh, about a drought of uh, three and a half years that God told him to go tell Elijah, send a messenger to uh, Ahab and let him know that he's going to bring rain and get ready for it. And so God did that. And He also, in chapter 17, healed a widow's son uh, that was dead. That's good healing. Amen. Brought him back to life and performed that miracle upon him. And also killed the uh, prophets of Baal and Ashtaroth. There were 850 of them. And God brought fire from heaven and devoured the sacrifice and wiped up the water with that fire. And it proved, and that's what Elijah's prayer was. Uh, Lord, let them see that you're God by doing this miracle. And God brought the fire from heaven and showed that it was God. And all of these things you would think that the people round about would get the message what? that there is a God in Israel. In fact, that there's just one God. Uh, Jezebel was an idol worshiper. Uh, Ahab was a uh, Samaritan of, of the group of Israelis that were left in Israel uh, during the captivity. And he came and he married this woman. Remember in Old Testament, we read time and time again where God told the kings not to gather wives unto them. And this is exactly why. Because they're going to make political alliances with these foreign wives. And these foreign wives are going to do what? They're going to bring in their false gods. And that's just exactly the gods that Ahab allowed for Jezebel to build temples to and to worship to. Uh, Jezebel loved these uh, false uh, uh, prophets, these uh, priests that were servants of Baal. Uh, she fed them. She clothed them. She gave them houses. Uh, they were nurtured by her. Her name, in fact, uh, means Baal is exalted. Uh, Jezebel means Baal is exalted. Everything that was about her was a false god idol worship. And that's how that she felt about it. And you can just imagine when we get into chapter 19 and we read the things that God did through Elijah, how that it upset her. And let's go into that uh, for just a little bit. Can keep, it, keep in the back of your mind uh, that the journey is too great for thee. Uh, the thought that I had for that is within our physical strength, uh, there are things we can do, and then there are a number of multiplied things that we cannot do. Amen? Uh, because our flesh gets weak. And I'm glad God's not like us. Amen? I need a couple of hours of sleep each night. Need a certain amount of food every day. I need a certain amount of companionship every day and all these here creature comforts that we have in this life. We need those things. God's not like that. 
Amen. He doesn't need food. He doesn't need sleep. He doesn't slumber. He keeps his eye on Israel. He keeps his eye on us. Uh, the Bible says, in fact, that Israel is the apple of God's eye, meaning that they're right in the center of God's attention. He's watching out for. He's looking over today. Uh, those that belong to him, I think about Elijah and the condition that he got into in chapter 19, where he was so depressed and so discomforted, uh, he forgot who God was. Amen. He forgot that God is the God of all creation, the God that supplies, uh, the Almighty God. In fact, Elijah's name means, my God is, uh, is Jehovah. My God is Jehovah. Can you imagine that? His name, Elijah, means, my God, Eli, my God, Elohim, Jehovah, amen, Jah, ja, Elijah, and my God is Jehovah, so everything about him speaks of the real God, the one that is, amen, of the God that God told Moses to tell Israel when you went to get them out of captivity in Egypt, and Moses said, who should I tell them, send me, and God said, tell them I am that I am, sent you, amen, uh, so what does that mean, what's the definition of the I am is, amen, it's God is the self self-existing God. All these other gods were made by Him. Uh, they were made out of sticks and stones and precious metal. Amen. But God's the only one that made all of those things. Amen. He's the one that is. I like uh, the title. I like the reference that He is God. I am the self-existing God. He exists without any other. Uh, someone said, what's that mean in Genesis when it says, in the beginning? Does that mean that's when God started? And I said, no, that's not when God started. Uh, that's when time started. Uh, that's when God started to reckon. God's always been. He's, he's immortal, amen. He's never had a beginning, and He's never going to have an end. He's always been. That's something to wrap our little finite minds around. Hard for me to wrap my mind around. But God has always been. He will always be. Amen. That's the God that we serve today. Elijah. My God is Jehovah. And so your strength will fail. God's strength is never going to fail. His word is forever settled. You can count on God not changing. Man changes. Amen. Time changes. Our houses, our cars, our clothes, our health, all these things change. But God is consistent. He's not going to change. If you can count on Him yesterday, you can count on Him today. You can count on Him tomorrow. Elijah forgot that. Of the man whose name is my God is Jehovah. I am. And he forgot who God was. And that's where we're kind of covered a little bit in Scripture. Bear with me. Uh, let's go to first, verse 1. And Elijah, uh, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. I can just see them uh, sitting in the kitchenette and they're eating and drinking a little bit of tea and crumpets or toast. And they're just sitting there. Oh, by the way, Elijah killed all your prophets the other day and just kind of really rung her bell. And uh, with all how he has slain the prophets with the sword. And he had an active involvement in it. Then look at verse 2. And Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods, small g, false gods, let the gods of Baal and Ashtaroth and all these others, Molech and all these other false gods, he, she's saying, let them do to me and more also. Let them slay me and let them do more than slay me. I don't know what she meant by that. Oh, once you're dead, you're dead, right? Amen. Well, how, what else can they do to you? Uh, but listen, we get a little bit further on in chapter 20. We find out once you're dead, that's not all there is to it. Uh, but look what she said. And so let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about that time. So here it is. 24 hours is going to pass and I'm going to behead you. I'm going to see you slain. And it makes me think about the world we live in today. Doesn't it you when you hear things like that by people that are not godly and they're ungodly? You think about the nations around and the Christians that are being persecuted and martyred uh, for the name of Christ. And the only crime uh, that they did, the only crime that Paul did, the only crime that Peter and John did when they were whipped by the high priest and the Romans and all that. And the only crime that was found against them, the only crime against Jesus was love. Amen. And them others loving Him. And the Bible says 
We love Him because He first loved us. Amen. We wouldn't know love. We wouldn't know God's love. If it wasn't for Him loving us like He did, wouldn't have it to begin with. We look in here and we find that Jezebel says she's just like one of them who wants to be had. Those that love Jesus Christ or love God and what He had done. And amen. She ought to be mad at God, not mad at Elijah. He's the one that had this thing set up. He's the one that got it done. God told it, uh, Elijah to go to Mount Carmel. Uh, God told Elijah to build up that altar and that sacrifice and to put the water on it. And Elijah was just following God. Uh, they, he, she ought to have been mad at God, not at Elijah. Amen. But a lot of times that's the way that the world looks at the church. It's the church's fault that things are the way they are. It's not the church's fault. It's God's fault. Better said it's God's will. Amen. Uh, because He knows what's going on. And you look around in our world today. How much longer do you think that this world is going to stand because of the way that it's going? Amen. We're losing our morals on a daily basis. Our Christians are losing their privilege on a daily basis. Their rights that God gave them. The rights that we have according to the Supreme Court. The rights that God gave us and have by our country. We're losing them a daily in my prayer. We see those that are evil being raised up. Exactly what was going on in their time. We live in a cruel, wicked world today. And my friend, only God is able to help and to make that difference. Look in verse 3. And when he saw, when he heard uh, that Jezebel had made a vow uh, to kill him within 24 hour period, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba. Now I looked that up to see how far of a journey he went uh, from where he was around Mount Carmel uh, to where that Beersheba was, was 80 miles. And so he made a lot of distance between him and Jezebel to make sure that he was prepared protected his life to the best of his ability. He forgot, amen, when he got in that desert, just exactly who God was and who God is. He's the well of living water. God is. And Jesus said, he that believeth on me out of his belly shall flow a well of living water. Elijah forgot. And you look at the victories that he had in chapter 17 and chapter 18, and it's hard to imagine uh, that he would allow himself to get to the place that he was in chapter 19. But that's just exactly where he got. And I think today that we forget that people in the Bible are just regular people, aren't they? Amen. They're just like us. I think about Moses, whenever that God told him to smite the rock, and he smited it. And then God told him the second time, whenever he wanted to rebuke Israel, he said, speak to that rock. And what did Moses do? He took the staff in his hand, and he hit the rock. Nothing happened. He took his rock and he hit it again and out came the water. But because of Moses' disobedience and not obeying God, God told Moses, you're not going into the promised land. You can look over into it, but you're not going bodily. Amen. Well, I read on the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses finally got there in his soul and his spirit of the night in his body. And so Moses was a great man of God, but he also failed. We look back at a couple of the others. Abraham, when he got where he's afraid of his life in Egypt, and he lied about Sarah being his wife. She was his wife. He said, she's my sister, so that it would no harm come to him. And we look at these people in the Bible, we find out that they were faulted. Even Peter, whenever that uh, he was uh, with the Jews and was going to minister to the Gentiles, and he made it as though he didn't know them. And Paul corrected him. Amen. These men fail. We fail. We come short of the glory of God. Should not be our practice. Should not be our desire. But it happens. What do we do when it happens? We better hit an altar somewhere. Amen. We need to make sure that we get to where God is able to forgive us uh, for the things that we've done this wrong. He went for his life. He went to Beersheba, 80 miles away. He forgot who God was. Where did he go? I looked on the map, and Beersheba is the area of desert. And I had a fellow time, and tell me one time, whenever he missed church a lot of times, he said, I said, where have you been? And he said, I've been in the desert. Amen. I've been in a rough and a dry and a barren place. My friend, my advice to you is not to go to the desert. It didn't work out too good for Elijah. It's not going to work out too good for you. Uh, the desert is a place where there's no spirit. It's a place where there's no water. Uh, there's a place where there's no life. It's a place that's barren and it's lonely. Don't go there. You've got 
by choice. I get on the mountain. That's where Moses was on the backside of the mountain when God appeared in the flame of a fire in, as an angel of the Lord. And he spoke to Moses. And Moses recognized it was a holy place. And what did Moses do? He took off his shoes. Amen. Uh, because he recognized that was the place where the God was. And so Moses went 80 miles into the desert. Look back at the next one. Verse 4. And they he himself uh, went into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. He requested. He wanted to die. Amen. And he said, I can't take it anymore if you read down a little bit further. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. Oh, my friend, I can just imagine how many of us have been to the place where Elijah has been from time to time. When you get to that place where you think, I just can't go on. I can't take any more. This is too hard. And I think about a lot of folks, that not like me, that really have a lot of things that are against them and all the trouble that they face from time to time. It's easy enough to understand where someone would come to the place where they say, it's enough. I don't want to live anymore. Take my life from me. Elijah had got to the place where he wanted to die. And he was praying for God to take his life. But here's one time when you can say, Thank God uh, that that prayer was an answer. Amen. Uh, thank God that God didn't answer that prayer. God gave Elijah what? No, I'm not going to answer your prayer like that. But God was on the scene. Someone said, where's God in all of my troubles? Where was God when He was depressed? Amen. Still on the throne. Still in control. Still answering prayer. Still supplying needs of all these things. About we may lose focus of what God's doing, but God's working whether we see Him or not. He's making a way whether we see Him or not. Amen. All these things that happen to us in our lives, God's still in control. We just simply need to trust Him in those times because He's not lost any of His abilities. Amen. And so He said, I can't take it anymore. Take my life. Amen. He wanted to die. He didn't want to die by Jezebel's hands. Amen. And I thought about that. I wanted that way. He should have just let it stay I'm there in Israel. He should have just left it. He should have walked up to her and said, Here I am. Amen. Take my life. No, he didn't really want to die, did he? He was just really perplexed and distressed in his mind with the way that things were. Let's go a little bit further. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, I sometimes when people uh, get a little bit upset, we'll call out to them and say, are you up in the juniper tree? Amen. Have you found yourself a place to lay down by the juniper tree? It's a place of, of, of depression. It's a place of hurt. And that's where Elijah was. He came to that place. It was a shady place. He done traveled 80 miles. And what was he? He was bone tired. No doubt he was what else? He was hungry. Amen. He needed something to eat. Probably took a little bit with him. Him and his servant. But he couldn't handle it anymore. And as he lay asleep under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. Oh, yes. Amen. I can't help but thank God and I praise the Lord when I think about that. God knows exactly what you need. Amen. God doesn't rebuke Elijah for what was going on with him, but He encourages him and He loves him. Amen. Uh, there are times when we come short of the glory of God we fail and if we may not recognize it, that God's working. Here God was working and Elijah didn't recognize it. God was going to help him and Elijah didn't recognize it. Instead of God or Elijah Elijah calling out to God, Elijah called out to the Sandman. Amen. He wanted to go to sleep and rest. But you think about this, when he opened his eye and the angels touched him, even though the body needs food and rest, he also needed an encounter with God. And this is part of an encounter with God. And he looked and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drank and laid him down again. Must have really been tired. Amen. After eating and drinking. And I thought of this as I studied. How much do you think he ate? How much do you think he drank? I believe he got full. I believe he satisfied the need of his body physically for food and water. He drank all that he needed at that time. And then he did something else because his body still needed rest because of what he had been through and what he was getting ready to go through. Have you ever been to that place spiritually 
where you, you, you need a little bit more. You wonder why I'm so tired. Why do I need to rest so much? And why do I want this or that or the other food or what it is? And you think about, well, that's not me. That's not normal. That's not the way that I am on a regular basis. And what happens to you? You get to that place where the, you get tired and you rest. God knows what you need. Amen. And He's working behind the scenes when you don't even know about it. And so we look here and Elijah's asleep. God gives him food. He lays back down the body. Uh, Jesus talked about the disciples. Remember in the garden, uh, the spirit indeed is willing, but the body is weak. Amen. And he looked, behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. Doesn't say nothing about him seeing the angel. And it did eat and drink and laid him down. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. Now that didn't happen the first time. That part of it telling the angel telling Elijah, but it happens now. And he said, Arise and eat. The journey is too great for thee. And he arose and he did eat and he drank and he went to strengthen that meat 40 days and 40 nights on the Horeb, the Mount of God. Where is Mount Horeb? It's on the bottom of the Sinai Peninsula. It is four or it's 200 miles away from where he was in Beersheba. 200 miles. Do you reckon he's got far enough away from Jezebel? Amen. Do you think he's got far enough away uh, so that the depression would start to leave him? He'd start to feel a little bit better? Amen. I don't know a lot of times where we're going to go in this life, but the Lord knows, and he's going to supply the need when we get there. Amen. And look at that. And he rose, he did eat, he drank, he went to strengthen that meat. 40 days and 40 nights on the Horeb, the Mount of God. Did he eat again? I don't know. But in the strength of what he ate and drank, he was able to take the journey. God is able to do things that we can't even begin to ask or imagine. Amen. And God is able to do above, beyond exceedingly what we're asked, or able to ask or think about. And he does here. Uh, going on the strength of that to Mount Sinai, uh, to where that Moses got the Ten Commandments. Amen. That's where he's at. He's finally at the bottom. Where also is he at? He's in the place where the, the uh, children of Israel, when they came up out of Egypt, out of the world, and they circled the Mount, uh, the uh, Sinai Peninsula for how many years? Forty years. Amen. They circled that mountain and that area of the Mount Sinai where the Ten Commandments were given for 40 years. How long did it take Elijah to get there? 40 days and nights. Amen. It's a time of wondering and introspection. It's where you need to stop and think about where you are with God. Uh, Paul said it like this to the Corinthians. He said, you need to think about where you are with God. Whether you are in the faith or not. That's good advice. Amen. And to consider whether you're in the faith or not. Because you're either in it or you're out of it. Amen. You can't be in both at the same time. And he said it there. He went in and he came thither to a man cave. That's what I thought about that. When I read it, Elijah came to his man cave. And it didn't have a big screen TV. Amen. Didn't have any ice machine. Didn't have any cold and hot running water of any kind. It was as barren as, as it could be. You know, I thought about Moses whenever that he was on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments and how that God or Moses said, Lord, I want to see your glory. I want to see your countenance. And God said, all right, I'll put you in the cleft of the walk in a hollow place in the mountain. And he said, I'm going to pass by you. And when I pass by you, I'm going to put my hand over your face so that you can't see my face. And so that when I get behind you, I will draw my hand and you can see my hinder part, the backside of God. And the God came by and he covered Moses so he couldn't see and passed by. And Moses saw the glory of God. You remember also when Moses came down from the mountain that his face shone Amen. From the glory that he saw on the mountain and the people were afraid of it because of it. And that's how they went. Moses or Elijah's in that place, I believe, where the God gave him the Ten Commandments and he saw the glory of God. Why do I think about that? Because Elijah is getting ready to see the glory of God. Amen. One more time. God on the mountain. And you think about this, and I think about Israel and Jerusalem and Mount Calvary and the, uh, the tomb that Jesus was buried in and uh, the victory coming out alive out of that tomb and all of those things. Those are marvelous and amazing things uh, that happened there. In the Old Testament, 
this mountain probably is one of the most particular places where the God revealed himself to the Israelites and the individuals that wanted to know. Here's the point I want to make about that. God is not too far from any of us. And if we want to see his glory, God's going to show it to us. Amen. I do believe we can get closer to God. And we don't have to stay far away where we can't hear His voice. Where we don't know where He's at. Because God wants to do what? He wants to reveal Himself to us. He wants us to know more about Him. But it's when we get to that place where we're uh, satisfied. Where we don't care no more. Amen. That's when we're in trouble. But God is able to do things. Last Sunday I talked about uh, Jesus sitting on the ground on the clay and making a, an anointment salve out of a spit in that clay uh, to touch the blind man's eyes and told him to go wash. He went to wash, washed off that spit in that clay, and he came back seeing. Amen. Uh, so we can't put God in a box and say, Lord, you've got to work in this particular way, and I'll know that it's you. Amen. We, we can't tell God how He's going to do His miracles, how He's going to work His work. All we've got to do is trust Him and believe. Let's go a little bit further. He came to the cave and He lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto Him. And He said unto Him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Now God wouldn't ask Him that so that Elijah might tell Him. God asked that so that Elijah might tell Himself. Why are you here, Elijah? Think about it. Think about chapter 18. Think about chapter 17. Think about the thing that you did. The power that you had. The ability that God has. Think about it. What are you doing here? And he said, I've been very jealous or zealous uh, for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altar, slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. He actually told it, didn't he? I fear for my life. I don't really want my life to be gone. And I'm afraid for my life. And so we get to that place where it happens from time to time. We get a little bit afraid for our lives. And Elijah was at that place. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. So he's in the cave. God said, get out of the cave and stand on the mount. Sit on the face of the edge of the mountain so that he could see. And behold, the Lord passed by in a great and strong wind. And the mountains break in pieces and the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. I can just imagine whenever that God had Elijah go out and stand on the edge of that cave entrance. And he's looking out over the valley across the mountain there. And he sees this great big wind coming up. And he sees it tearing up the trees. And the mountains start to quake and they fall. And the first thought that I would have had, God told me to leave the cave and get on the edge so that I could see this. That must be God. God's not always in drama. Huh? God's not always in drama. Can't, God can be in the, in the wind. Amen. Another euphemism for the Holy Spirit is the wind. So God can be in the wind, but He wasn't in this wind. He didn't want to use this big thing to get Elijah's attention. And after the wind and earthquake... But the Lord was not in the earthquake. I just see Elijah out there again. The wind has come. It's done its thing and it's settled. And Elijah may have went, wow, that was amazing. Then he sees and he hears and he feels the earthquake. And he looks out there and he sees the mountains splitting and rocks tumbling and all the trees again coming that the wind blew down. All of them are falling down now because of the earthquake. But the Lord was in an earthquake. I would imagine if I was Elijah and I seen the wind and I seen the earthquake, well, there's where he's at. There's God in that earthquake. But the Lord was in an earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. What kind of fire? Do you reckon it was lightning? Do you reckon the lightning started a forest fire and was burning up things around it? That would be awesome. God often moved by fire. God also, also moved by earthquakes. God moved by the wind. But God was in any of those things. Now having said that, you know the rest of the story, right? Don't you just love it that God can also be a still, small voice. He can speak to your heart. You can be all by yourself. 
I've heard God speak to my, my being, my person, with His still small voice. In fact, I've heard God speak to the point that I thought He was speaking aloud. He was speaking audibly, and I could hear Him with my ears, even though He spoke to my spirit. I've actually heard God in my spirit as He spoke to me. We see there that it was after the fire, fire, there was a still, small voice. Here's the point. I think of all the things that Elijah saw, he might say, there's God. God spoke in a still, small voice. And I would imagine that maybe that that would be the thing that he wasn't looking for. That he didn't expect. How many times things happen that we don't know why they happen. And it's not no great thing, but it really is something when you stop to think about it. And Elijah got to that place. That's a still, small voice. But it spoke directly to Elijah. You see, Elijah needed a personal encounter with God. In this depression and stuff, he was not able within his own self for the journey, the strength of the journey. He needed to have faith in God. He needed to trust God because of what God was able to do. Jezebel, her name means that Baal is exalted. Elijah means that God is Jehovah. My God is Jehovah. And we think about all these things and I thought about it as I studied a Psalms chapter 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. That last part of that, we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Elijah, my God, is Jehovah. He forgot. Has the devil ever been so hard on you that you forgot that God is in charge? That He's the one that is? Amen. When Elijah heard the voice, verse 13, he wrapped his face in his prophet's mantle, got a little bit uh, shy or embarrassed at it, and stood in the entering end of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What doest thou here? Elijah, second time. And he tells the same story. I'm afraid for my life. After what I've done, killed all them prophets. The Lord said unto him, Go, return unto thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, 280 miles back. And when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. You know, as I studied that, I wondered why God wanted Haziel to be king over Syria has nothing to do with Israel. There were no Israelites supposed to be living in Syria. It wasn't Israel. It wasn't Judah. It wasn't the land that God gave them. But God had a plan for Ezekiel. He was going to use it. We read about it a little bit earlier. He's going to have a hand in destroying all those prophets, false gods of, of Baal, of Ahab and Jezebel, Ashtoreth, Moloch, and all of those others. Anoint Haziel to be king over Syria, a nation I've got nothing to do with other than that they're around Israel and cause trouble. And so God said, I want to anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And then Jehu, who was a uh, Jewish person, the son of Nimshi, shot anoint to be king over Israel. That's the ten northern tribes. The son of Shaphat of Abometh, Hola, shot by anoint to be prophet in thy room. So he, he got a plan. Elijah couldn't see that plan in his depression. And he had to get to a place where they could hear a still small voice. When he got there, God was able to speak to him. And so what did God do? I understand. Pat him on the back. Comfort his head. If I understand you're depressed and you're troubled, but get over it. No. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get back out there on the front line and get out there. I'm still in control. I'm still in charge. Let me have my way. Anon has the king over Syria, Jehu over Israel, and then Elisha as your successor and as your friend. God gave him everything he needed. Gave him a task. Gave him a plan. Amen. Showed him how to accomplish it. All you got to do is trust and follow me. It's been that way ever since the beginning. They talked about Noah and the big boat. God had the plans for that. Was it Noah's plans? It was God's plans. 
Noah is just obedient to God. And it shall come to pass that him that escaped the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay. Him that escaped the sword of Jehu shall Elisha, your successor, slay. And then he said this in verse 18. Remember two, two times Elijah said, I, only I, am left alone. And yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel, the northern tribes, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which thou, every mouth which hath not kissed him. Of those that have fallen to this false god, small g, I've got 7,000 that haven't. Elisha thought he was the only one left. Man, my, my, my. We're not in this thing alone. We've got folks who love Jesus going with us. But sometimes we feel like we're alone. Have you ever felt like you were alone in the crowd? Uh, but no one understood. God understands. Even though He didn't have that 7,000, He could count on because He thought He was the only one. He could have counted on God. Because God didn't go no place. It was Elijah that was running, trying to get away from what was going to happen to him if he stayed and didn't trust God. The journey is too great for you. Sometimes because of the way that our children are gone, we get depressed and troubled. The journey is too great for us. Sometimes a wife through a husband or a husband through a wife will think that the journey is too great. I can't handle it now. It is enough. Sometimes it's because of work. Sometimes our job uh, we're, it's just beyond our ability and uh, things happen where we're not able to focus and we think that it's enough and our government, the condition that it's in and people not wanting to vote because what do you, who do you vote for? Which way do you go? I can understand it. Amen. And we just don't know what to do anymore. It's enough. I'm ready for Jesus to come back and the condition and the things and the way that they are. And I think about this last week with North Korea. In the United States, certainly one of the signs of the end time, and people don't realize that, that that's a sign of the end time. And they're going to rise up, and they're going to be against Israel. You think about the nation, Russia, and North Korea and Russia, and uh, China. China said, well, we'll be with you as long as you don't fire the first shot. But if you fire the first shot, we're with North Korea. Amen. The Chinese, the North Koreans, the Russians, all of these. Syria, the trouble that's on there. Amen. All those things are enough. If you think about it, you think this, that the journey is too far. I can't make it in my own strength, my physical ability. But God's not lost any of His power. We just trust Him. Amen. Put our hand in His great big hand. That's what Elijah did. I'm not going to read you the rest of the chapter, but that's exactly what Elijah did. He went and did everything that God told him to do. I talked about Moses, whatever, that he disobeyed God and God took him where he could look over into the promised land and then God killed him and buried him so that nobody could find Moses. Elisha and Elijah is walking along one day and a, a chariot of fire comes and sweeps Elijah up. And Elijah's mantle falls and Elisha picks it up. And he strikes the water, seeing it part, saying these words, where is the Lord God of Elijah? He sees, amen, and recognizes. God's got a plan. He has the authority to carry out that plan. Are you willing to trust Him? Are you willing to follow Him? Amen, that's the point. That's the question I'd like to ask you and present to you today. Where are you at with the Lord? Do you know that your heart's right with God? Are you trusting Him? Are you following His plan? I desire for you to know Jesus Christ this morning in a full part of sin. One day, these old bodies are going back to dust. But your soul and spirit eternal. Where will that soul and spirit spend eternity? As we stand, we get a presentation number. Page 81.